I'm going to speak about um, people first impact method abbreviated as PFIM. This is uh, simply um, an approach that we are using and, uh, to give the people the, the voice or to amplify the voices of the community. Uh, the people first impact method is we, we, we are talking about actively listening to communities and um, in the end promoting community driven social change. So the end, at the ultimate end is to promote community driven social change by actively listening to communities. So we see that it's a community engagement approach and uh, uh, what we are saying is that the starting point is always the people in communities, right from the planning stage of um, interventions. The focus is on the people and communities and not really organizations and projects because we believe in adding quality or enhancing what is going on already in the community. In, in the context that are already there, analyzing those contexts, um, having people at the center and using them to analyze those contexts and improving, adding quality to what is already going on there, rather than coming and bringing an, a new intervention without even considering the voice of the people. It's all about creating an open space where communities can have open conversations and issues that are important for them, to them. And um, I'm going to be explaining how this works, but uh, we, we are using community dialogue facilitators. Uh, so as I mentioned, the emphasis is put on actively listening to communities. That means you're able to understand the context because it's the people that live within those contexts in their various facets. And then we are seeking just to enhance community responsibility for, res for response to the issues there that are there, the challenges, the issues. Rural Women Peace Link is using this approach to amplify community voices. Again, also to strengthen the linkages between these communities and the state and non-state actors. We have been using this approach to majorly um, do this, to achieve these two objectives. And now, how, how is this done? So I'll walk, let, I'll walk us through how, how this is done. We start by training a group of facilitators. These are just people based in the community, living with this, within those communities them, them, by themselves. We train them on this method, people first impact method. It's a, an entire tool. So preferably 24 people. Thereafter, we, we use these facilitators to select a represent, representative community groups. Sorry, not 24, um, should have been preferably eight because three facilitators are supposed to facilitate discussions in each community group. So working with the 24 facilitators, they help us to select from the community representative groups who, if we are able to meet and uh, hold discussions with, we are able to get the voice of the community. So thereafter, after say we get eight representative community groups, the next thing would be to organize for goal free or open community dialogues or conversations. This is where now we use the facilitators to, um, to hold these um, conversations simultaneously. So let's say for instance, um, the facilitators say that if we meet the youth, if we meet the women, if we meet village elders and so forth, if we meet this group, these eight groups, we're able to get um, the voice of say community A. So we organize for goal-free or open community conversations. These are conversations that are not goal-oriented, they are open. So we just go and ask them, for example, in the past X number of months or number of years, what has been going on in this community? Then they're able to bring out issues that are important for them, not issue rather than going with a goal, with, with a goal-oriented um, question, where they're just able, they would just respond to those questions. So goal-free community conversations. Thereafter, we will analyze the feedback from the community and select major impact statements. These are statements that stand out or issues that stand out or issues that have been mentioned more than once by the community groups. After analyzing them and say we come up with 
seven major impact statements, we organized for a subsequent goal-focused community conversations. The second round is goal-focused because now we go to them with the major issues that they addressed and we ask them, we now um, hold two-way two -way dialogue, we use two-way engagement to now engagement, engage them further on these seven issues. Let's say said the seven issues. Let's say, for instance, the one of the issues that they raised was, um, let's say, lack of water. So in the second, the second, um, the second forum, we we then go back to them and ask them about what about this lack of water? What is going on? What is being done? What can be done? By who? What can the community do? And so we develop a report from this second round of engagement which then is going to be presented finally in an interface forum that brings the community together with relevant stakeholders according to the issues raised. And in this platform, they are going to develop joint action plans. So in a nutshell, that's how people first impact method works. Um, beginning from the training of the facilitators down to the interface forums whereby uh, the amplified community voice is able to get a uh, space um, where it can be addressed jointly. So this is just um, an illustration of how you can remember the people first impact method just um, it helps you to remember what it's all about. So really it's, um, it's a tool that is really focuses uh, on the people it's that interventions are for the people, they are by the people and with the people. And we see that it's a, particip a highly participatory approach. The communities are at the center of creating solutions to their very own issues. It heavily relies on open dialogue processes that I have explained, and it seeks to bring about community-led social change. And we also see that yeah, it also engages state and non-state actors for sustainability. So in, br in brief, that is the People First Impact Method. Um, I hope this brief presentation um, um, brings um, an understanding to your minds about the method. Thank you. I'm going to make a presentation on the steps of implementing community scorecard as a community-based approach for participatory. Community scorecard is derived from uh, social accountability, which is defined as a citizen-led action to demand for accountability, especially from public officers. And the aim of this is to enhance citizens' voices in order to be heard on issues of development and governance within a community. So under the social accountability, there are various tools that we have. We have a participatory planning, participatory budgeting, and community scorecard is one of the tools under the social accountability process. And for the community scorecard, now, why it was selected or why we use it as one of the tools to engage the community, it's because of its simplicity and it engages all communities without discriminating those who are illiterate or literate or from vulnerable background. It's a tool which is flexible and it's easily adaptive for every community member. So for the community scorecard is a tool under the social accountability that uh, adopts a participatory appro approach and is commonly a community driven, driven process whereby the community pick up the process and they facilitate it through the process, the development of issues until also to the end when, whereby they actualize part of their interest and some part of the changes that they'd want to see in a community. It also allows citizens to analyze any particular service or any function offered by any public uh, body or any public servant or any public service that has been uh, is, is obligated to them. And they can be able to use this tool to be able to express their personal feeling, dissatisfaction, and provide encouragement where, whereby 
if our, our service is being done well, the community can be able to also be able to push for this particular service to be encouraged. So for the community scorecard, it's usually used when assessing for development process, when assessing services or public uh, sectors within a community. So why is it important for community to adopt a community scorecard or why is it that community rural women peace link uses community scorecards within the community? Uh, it is a community driven and a community owned initiative that seeks to bring a positive change from the public or within with the public trying to bring positive change. It also assists in the identification of challenges in a particular service by a community. I can give an example in a health center or uh, in a dispensary, if the community are dissatisfied within the particular service offered by within the outpatient or a particular service provider, the community scorecard is an opportunity whereby they can be able to raise this issue and to be able to address this particular issue to be able to have a positive change. The community scorecard process also allows for the community to monitor the quality of services track the resources. These are in terms of the money allocated to them by the county government or the national government or any other resources given to them. And to be able to see how these particular resources that are directed towards development are being used. And they can be able also to be an opportunity whereby they can be able to give feedback to the service providers who are, who are in that particular service and to be able to see how best they can be able to influence for a positive change. It also strengthens the voices of citizens because in this particular process, it's not the stakeholders who are taking lead, but it's the communities who are taking lead on this. And also um, the scorecard also gen score scores generated are used to generate conversation between the service pro service providers and the community, whereby if it's a facility, say like agriculture, the officers in agriculture and the community or the farmers can be able to come together and have a dialogue on how best can we improve crop production or how best can we improve on issues of cooperative or issues of incentives for the community. So the community scorecard is not uh, a process which takes one day. It's a process which takes a period of up to six or even up to one year. So it's a process whereby the community start the process. It starts with community sensitization, whereby we identify a particular community, sensitize them through civic education, whereby we educate them on their rights, we educate them on their responsibilities, and also we educate them on some of the tools that they can be able to use to assess the services that are offered or, or how they can also be able to participate in governance process or in development process within a particular community. Once the sensitization process is done, then we can be able to go to generating of issues with the community, whereby they raise some of their problems that they feel it wants to be addressed. Then they proceed to a process called extracting of obligation. This is just a chart. I will be able to explain this further down the slides. Then we go to data analysis, review, and processing of the information that they have provided. Then we go to data collection with the service providers, whereby we also give an opportunity for the public officials or the service providers to also assess the services that they are giving to the community and to be able to see in which places they can have an improvement on the work or the output that they give. Then after that, we go to a validation meeting whereby the community validate the information that it has been gathered. Then after that, we go to a process where it's a closure or a culmination of this process, whereby we have the interface meeting and action planning, whereby this is where the service providers and the community come together to find solution on some of the problems.
Here I'll just explain the steps so that we can be able to have a better understanding. So as I mentioned earlier, the first step is community sensitization. Here, first of all, we sensitize the community on the, on the scorecard process on how it is of importance or how it is of benefit to them so that they can be able to engage in, in assessing some of the services offered by public facilities. In this stage, uh, during a community scorecard, all the community members are involved in this process, but only a few can be able to work in terms of assessing and sifting the data. So the community choose a representative, which is called a community scorecard, sorry, a scorecard committee representation, whereby it is a representation of at least seven to 10 members, whereby we have female, male, youth, persons with ability, and elders, whereby we have a diverse gender representation. These are the committee who will represent them during this particular process and act as facilitators during this particular process. Remember, this is a community driven process. So if we have the community members, just like the PFIM committee, who are the ones assisting the community or facilitating the community, it is to their own interest to take to own the process and to take leadership on this. Once the community are sensitized and they have selected a committee, they, they then proceed to generating issues with the community. This is whereby the community raise all issues pertaining a specific service, then they prioritize from the most urgent need they wish to influence towards a positive income. Like uh, an example I can give, when a community go to a particular facility, probably they might have issues with uh, uh, availability of drugs, um, like say maternity issues, outpatient issues, availability of water, but more, all these things are there are challenges for, that the community face. But while they're generating these issues, they have to prioritize these particular issues with the one which is the most urgent, the one that they want to start handling as they progress towards attaining or, uh, or undertaking all other particular challenges as well. Then once they are done with the raising of the issues, they go to extracting of obligation, commitment, or service standards. Obligations or commitment or service standards, these are the services that are entitled to the community, what the government has committed to do about this particular service. These particular obligations are, 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 are extracted from policy documents, service standards such as the healthcare service standards. Uh, these are also within the county budget or the national budget, what the government has committed to do for a particular community. So during the first process, the first three stages, it's whereby the community sit down, they analyze their issues, they be able to prioritize which particular sector that they'd want to work in and they extract obligation so that they can be able to move now to the next stage whereby they'd want now to assess or analyze these particular challenges that they have. After they've extracted the obligation and they understand that in this particular service, this is what we are entitled. If it's in a public facility like a dispensary, uh, the community is entitled to having at least three to four nurses in that particular station. If the facility has one or two uh, nurses, that's whereby they come to understand within the obligations, within the commitment given to us, what are we supposed, what are we supposed to advocate for in order to improve the services in a particular sector? So once they have uh, in stage four, data analysis, review, and processing. Here, the scorecard committee, the committee of the seven to 10 members that they had selected earlier, sit down and, and create neutral indicators pertaining the issues they raised. I can be able to give an example to this. If the community raised an issue of drug availability, probably the facility has less 
drugs. The scorecard committee sit down and come up with neutral indicators. An indicator can be availability of drugs. Here, they create indicators for each particular challenge or for each particular issue the community had raised. Then once they create these indicators, the community develop a matrix. And this matrix uh, has a scoring scale, maybe from one, being very poor or bad, two, poor or bad, three, fair, moderate, four, good, five, good, sorry, five, very good. Then the community take the indicators that they had developed and score it with this particular scoring skill. If the drugs or the drug services in this particular facility were, were very poor or they were not available or they were scarce or in other days one would go to the facility and miss out to get some few drugs, they would come to the scoring skill and say very poor, poor, or moderate, depending on how the community feel or have dissatisfaction or have satisfaction of a particular service. So during the data process, the community are separated into focus group discussions, whereby they can have up to three or five focus group discussions. Within the focus group discussions, we can have one for women, one for men, one for youth, one for persons living with disability, and one for the elderly. Why do we, why do we se separate uh, or have a diverse gender in this particular scorecards? Is it, it, is, it is for this particular group to be able to assess the indicators and give a proper score based on how they feel that this particular facility, this particular services affects them. One thing we have noticed during our, our com communities undertaking the community scorecard, women have a different perception towards maternity services or towards other services, as opposed to how men also reflect on this particular service or the youth also reflect or perceive this particular service. So once the communities are, have gone into the focus group discussion, they assess these particular indicators and these particular issues based on their feelings. They later on come and have a bigger or a, say a community conversation whereby now they sit down and generate a bigger community scope, scorecard whereby it now is a reflection of the general community and during the community scorecard deliberations and discussions are, are primarily and driven by the communities themselves as rural human peacekeeping or as facilitators we always take a back seat and let the community drive that particular process so uh, then we move on to the next uh, step where it's collection with the service providers. So here, the service providers also take the same process in undertaking, in undertaking a community scorecard them themselves. The process aims at coming up with indicators to determine how the service providers evaluate the service and identify opportunity for improvement. As much as the community themselves we give them an opportunity in the community scorecard to assess a particular service. We equally also give this opportunity to the, to the service providers so that they also can assess this particular service so that it, is, it does not come as a scenario whereby we are, we are doing something called like witch hunting or pointing fingers. It also gives everyone within the community both an opportunity to be able to see how they can all come together and, and, and improve a particular sector or a particular service in development. Then we have the last uh, step, sorry, the second last step, which is called the validation meeting. This is where the community validate the report from the community scorecard process and interlink their findings with that of the service providers or stroke public officers to have one report. 
Here we give an opportunity now that the service providers have their own report. The community also have their own report. This particular facility or this particular service or sector within our community, it serves us all. So they all come together and combine their report to have one report that reflects the whole entire community. Then at the end of all this process, at the culmination of this particular process, it is where now the community organize a joint meeting between the service providers and the community and the government officials and the stakeholders, everyone who is involved at that particular sector are involved in one way or another at improving that particular self sector to come up and deliberate on how or create action plans on how they can be able to move forward as a community to be able to improve the services or the output of this particular process. Remember, during the community scorecard, the community undertake this particular action separately without influence of anyone or any external influence. They undertake this particular process separately and also the service providers undertake this particular process separately and at the end they come to develop one action plan. So at the end of it, a community scorecard is an opportunity whereby any community member, be it a woman in the rural area who is illiterate, has not had an opportunity to go to school, they can be able to participate in this since they are just working towards giving their, satisfac their satisfactions or their dissatisfaction of a particular service and influencing on how they see this service can be able to, to provide for them a better, or they can influence this particular change. So here, I'd want to share on some two case studies or some of some of the community scorecards that we have undertaken within the community. So we undertook one community scorecard at Kaptumo Dispensary in Wasingishu County. Uh, the the, so the community scorecard was undertaken in uh, Kaptumo Dispensary, which is a level two health facility. And the community within the location of Kaptumo, about 120 participated in this particular process. And also six service providers within Kaptumo Health Facility also participated in the community scorecard. As you see the photo down there, that is the photo of the women focus group discussion, just assessing the services that they are offered in this particular facility. And on the other right hand side, we see the nurses also having an opportunity to score or to be able to assess the services that they offered. So uh, these are some of the key achievements as a result of the community scorecard that we have been able to see uh, at the end of the scorecard process. As I, I had mentioned earlier, community scorecard takes a process, uh, like in the case of the community scorecard taken in Kaptumo dispensary, it was undertaken in the year 2018 to 20. 19. But over the years in 2020 and 2021, we have been able to track the progress of this particular scorecard that was undertaken by the community, with the community. Some of the key achievements is that the facility received two additional personnel, that was the laboratory technologist and, and, and nurse, and this has improved services and has seen increase of patients from 700 to 1,000. Initially, the facility only had one, two nurses, and one nurse had a back complication, and she was the one residing within the facility. So during the evenings, when women, or at night, when women needed assistance for maternity, they were always uh, redirected to another health facility, which was more or less like 30 kilometers away, because the nurse present had a back complication and was not able to assist the, the women. 
In the case of the laboratory, the dispensary had a laboratory, but it was not functional since there was no lab technicians. But immediately after the community school had, immediately after the community presenting their issues to the government, officials uh, within weeks of them undertaking the communities of get them providing the report from the community scorecard they were given two additional personnel that's a laboratory technician and a nurse and currently as we speak the maternity is operational at night then the, the facility was also able to be allocated funds where a borehole was drilled and Initially, there was no water in the maternity, but as we speak, with the borehole, it's serving the maternity, the lab, the outpatient, and the entire community also with the school near the dispensary. The dispensary was also able to get to be equipped by a BP machine, auto club machine, oxygen machine, two pediatric wing scale, and one adult height and wing scale have also been added to the facility. This has also improved the antenatal. Initially, when women went for clinics during the antenatal, they had to share the wing scale between the outpatient antenatal, which was also very hectic for the community. So this is just a uh, part of the gallery. We have here the community undertaking the community scorecard process. On the top left side, those are, this is the area, the ward administrator of the area with the scorecard committee who had been selected. They were just making follow up with the ward administrator to see some of the recommendations that they had given. Where have they reached or how, what is the progress? So uh, down there, you can also see an uh, right to the bottom uh, and a validating meeting whereby we had the community and the nurses coming together to be able to share their report. So and this is the, uh, the last case study, Capteach Dispensary in Nandi. So uh, Capteach Dispensary is also a level two and we are able to do a community scorecard with 120 community members and six service providers in that particular facility. As you see, you can be able to see the men's focus group discussion, the women's focus group discussion, the men writing something on the wall, <coughs> sorry, as they were assessing some of the information or pro pro processing the data that they had received from the community. So uh, some of the key achievements as a result of the community scorecard in Capteach, uh, initially, the, when the, the scorecard process had begun in this particular facility, the facility did not had an old outpatient block, but within the process of the community, uh, owning the process, driving the process, they were able to be allocated the funds and they were able to construct a new, a new outpatient block. So, and during this, the initial onset of the scorecard community, scorecard process, the facility only had one nurse who was not able even to go for leave or to be able to take off. So the person was being overworked and also used to experience out, uh, burnouts. So as a result of the scorecard process, the community lobbied for one additional nurse who was uh, directed to that particular facility. And now currently as we speak, they, they are both working hand in hand, but the community also are pushing to also have an additional one or two uh, uh, nurses in this particular facility based on the standards or the entitlements that they have within the policy. Then the facility now has power supply, which uh, has directly improved child immunization in that particular facility. Initially, the facility did not have electricity. So it was only on Tuesdays that the women could go for clinic, whereby vaccines would be brought from another health facility away, which had power so that the women can be able to have this particular service. But uh, immediately after the community scorecard process within a month or two uh, power supply was channeled to that particular facility and currently as we speak they have refrigeration of vaccines for that but and the women enjoy access of service of vaccination throughout the week 
all this uh, speaks to how community participatory and community efforts when redirected or when community are sensitized they can be able to push for a lot of influence and they can be able to come together to drive for change within a community thank you It is important to, to mention that understanding trauma is important before we jump into healing that this what we I think or what we imagine as trauma. And that is where now like the almost the research began, begins. And so before as we for us to understand um, this trauma, some of the questions that we ask ourselves is how do people describe their own trauma? Where do people get say what do they say they get? The, the trauma, how is trauma passed from generation to another? For those of us who have been in trauma our class, healing training class, what are some of the important things we need to understand concerning trauma healing? For example, emotions, the readiness and the courage to confront those very trauma in order to allow reconciliation itself before healing begins. What is the nature of trauma that you, you want to address? And what is the level of Is it an interpersonal, interpersonal, intragroup? Is it intercommunity? And then we, in the, within that nature, we want to understand is this, is, this the prim, is this primary level trauma? That is a trauma that affects health direct or is it a secondary trauma? And so if it is a primary level of trauma, it means we have to gather the data primary that will actually help the process of preparation. If it is a secondary trauma, then again, we have to look at both primary and secondary data to help us. So uh, footprints method in data collection. In the footprint, we are about to see a photo uh, of how it's done. But in, in application of footprint uh, method in data collection, the first instruction that we give is take a flip pen and then ask the, 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 the women or the girls that we or the boys or men, we ask them to to take the, to, to step on the flip charts and trace or draw both feet on it. So on one, we tell them on one foot, print, write some of the things that you think you have stepped on. <laughs> so when you instruct them to draw their first footprint, we give them time. And we give them time so that they can reflect, they can think, they can walk along the journey, look at exactly what are these that I have been stepping on. So then, then we again instruct them that on the remaining foot, print, write some of the things that keep you walking. Remember, in one side, they have already, they have already written what they are stepping on. On one side is what is this that is keeping them moving. So this is an exercise. This is a session that we had with these girls. Through so Women Peace Link has has a program on mentorship, and so we 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 work with girls from conflict affected areas, and of course women from conflict affected areas. One of the the reason that we started this process was we realized that as we were supporting girls in schools and even partnering with schools to uh, even pay school fee and give them uh, we realized that the emotional support was still lacking we realized the performance was quite low and we realized that some of them were not just picking up in life and we we were very disturbed and we were very concerned is what exactly is going on in the life of these girls some of these girls and most time you would if you just we just brought them to start talking one-on-one -on -one, they would not speak. Instead, they would end up 
um, uh, crime. And so we thought it's very important that we find a way of making them to speak, making them to open up and making them to release information and the data that will help us to analyze and help them. And so this is where we started. So you can see these girls are in a session, they are drawing their footprints. What did they, what did they say in their footprints? So this is, in this diagnosis and in this data, generating data, we, some of the girls, and this is one of the girls, she says that I have stepped on rejection and had to find a way to learn to accept who I am. And then on the other, she says, I have learned to struggle because where I have been through, mom says, one day you are going to be great, to great places. So there is, she says what she has stepped on and she says at the same time, what kids are going. So this one is, is a, fit, a footprint coming from a different session altogether, not the same, same groups. These are now teens. And so the same, same process gives us the data and information that tells us that this young person has really been stepping on things that are a little bit dangerous. So she's been talking about unfocused friends who are actually um, a company that is actually um, influencing his life or her life in a direction that is not so pleasant to her or to him. But with this one, after time, enough time, adequate time of reflection, this one does not have anything much. This is also data. This is information. And what we're asking is, what exactly are these saying? Why is this not speaking? What is the level of trauma? What's the level of, 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 of what she, she or he is going through that makes him or her do the footprints but not able to write anything? So these ones, so what makes me keep going is um, self-control. And of course, she says so many other things. So this, uh, this one is a story. If you read, you hear what they are saying. Self-control is, 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 is keeping her going. But on the other side, you will get to hear some of the things that she stepped on. The story of how she was not able to be in school and the mother was jobless and um, she had to um, stop, um, uh, stop her schooling, her education at some level and stay home and at school, how some, some, sometimes she's ridiculed. And so it's a whole, her whole narrative and the whole data which she could not express. So the next is about the river, using application of the river of life. Now the river of life and the footprints can be used to achieve the same goal or completely different uh, uh, goals. So when we have the footprints, we can use the river of life to verify what the footprints are saying, the data that we have, con we have collected through foot footprints. But we can also use the river of, the data from the river of life to continue with the steps of inquiries. And we are going to see maybe one of the river of life to check exactly how we can verify and how it has verified and how it can be used again to stage another uh, point of inquiry. So if you read this one, and then you try to, to remember the footprints that was blue where they, the, the person was talking about, um, about bad friends, a bad influence, then you already are seeing that this is the same person who drew this. Because now this one, we did the, the footprints, and then after the footprints, we again took them through the stage of the river of life. In the river of life, we ask the, we ask the participants or the, from the communities to draw 
to reflect on their life right from childhood. And then take the image of a river and think of how the river flows. And then we ask them to identify and to imagine their lives in the, as the, the river flowing. And, and then to identify right from childhood what, how their waters of life have been moving along and be able to identify what in those rivers have been either stepping stones or obstacles as a way of checking what they have done through footprints or as a way of just trying to present it without necessarily looking at uh, anything new. But we do it around the check. So this one, you see the person is saying, when she, he or she was young, there was the dodging of the church. It goes and the river has flown, spending time with group, bad groups, and then continue to talk about these bad groups and then the drugs. And then of course, attending nightclubs, sneaking from school and getting into clubs. And then uh, the river flows and the river flows to a, a, a point of changing, the turning points. Any researcher or anyone who wants to interpret this would definitely look at this and say, what are some of the things? What are some of the, 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 the issues that are really affecting these teens in this very particular location? So the next photo, this is now another river of life from another session. And this river of life also is, talk, is, is, is talking about, actually from, not from, from the same footprint. The, the, same, the same girl who drew the footprints, talking about the mother, now when we were checking uh, if, if the records would give us the same results through the river of life, then she writes and she starts saying how she's attended a primary school, nursery school, primary school. And then the another stage is um, getting into um, uh, a situation where she couldn't pay her, her school fee because the mother became jobless. And then she draws this river of life and there are trees, but inside the water, you can see she has drawn a crocodile. And then she goes and she draws stones, but within that, she talks about how her life sticks. Now, when we look at, when, 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 we, when, when we are analyzing this, then we look at this crocodile, for example. You, you, we say that this is a high risk river. This, which represents tough life journey which makes this person very vulnerable. And so what, what can happen is at the point of crocodile, you may want to open another inquiry. And so we want, when we start the process of trauma healing, we look at that and we mark and we say, tell us more about the crocodile, how did this crocodile look like? What did the crocodile do, you know? So, and then we again move at this, the stone. So you realize that this, this, uh, this, this, this uh, person has drawn stones, stepping stones saying, as much as there were crocodiles, there are also some stepping stones. And then according to this, stepping stones were like, oh, I managed to go back to school and I was able to do my, 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 my class eight with support from uh, well wishers. And then uh, she draws um, uh, the river flowing and there is a stick. And we know in that stick, she talks about how she was encouraged. There are these people in her life who came to encourage her, to, to tell her how she could respond to some of the issues and some of the problems that she was facing. Now, this is still uh, another, uh, another river of life of someone, of course, saying I went to primary school, my mother, my father, now this is now saying my father lost a job, but between the time this person was young up to here, up to where he went to primary school, the person says I had no challenges. I had no challenges. And so, 
I moved on until there was lack of school fee. And we, how did that affect? How did that affect the life of this person? And then, of course, um, the parts of that are not uh, being, being very visible. We, 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 we see that uh, the person had lost hope. And um, ahead there, the person lost hope and got, got into um, uh, quite a number of criminal activities, um, which we left out. Uh, so, so, so again, the data and the information from here. So the next thing that we are going to see is how, what we do after all this data. There are a lot of them, we couldn't put them now, but after this, what, what next? So once we have a session, a session where we take our uh, the, 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 the girls and the women from all these affected by conflict, affected by domestic violence, we, once we have them through a session, and the session does not take one day, it's up to five days, between three to five days, residential, and then a follow up. And so the first time we can give them opportunity to first do um, um, their footprints, and then they will have their own other activities in between, and then we take them through River of Life. And then we have this in a safer room somewhere. And we bring those who are able, who are supposed to analyze the, the, this information. So we go through, we go through, um, they go through, we go through the, the, the information and cluster them. And once we cluster them, you can show the, also the other photo. Once we, we cluster them, we, we start discussing and thinking of how what kind of intervention, how we can have develop content, the content that will respond to some of the issues that have been analyzed, some of the issues that have been analyzed. You can see um, uh, some of us were looking at these things, that is uh, me and, and Mary at the back, Mary is in Baringo and Masi, but you see there are some things like flowers. So these ones, the stage, the last stage after footprints, footprints and um, the river of life, we do not just live at that stage. We want to know what are they, now that they have drawn, they have given data, they have talked, they have spoken through their feet and through their, through, through their river of life. We don't just stop at that. We ask them, we want to hear what exactly would you want to see happen. It's like more of like, what are you recommending? And so we get through a stage where we ask them what they value. So what I value? Information on their needs and their priority. And we let them to use the flower kind of, tell them to draw a flower and say what you value and put it on the petals of a flower. And what you don't value that you think affects you and re-traumatize you on the outside. And so you see, they have said, I value dignity. You can see Cherub there saying, I value dignity. I value respect. I want to be respected. I value hospitality. I value courtesy. I value self-driven personality. And then say, I, do, I don't value isolation. I don't value dishonesty. I don't value uh, jealousy. And then, of course, we also have Hilda talking about what they value and what they do not value. So these are, these are all what they value, what they don't value. And they are all, they are all different because they, each, each person is given the opportunity to talk to himself or herself in her own exclusion. So we take all this and we try to, as we analyze, we try to find out what are, what is common? How do we merge what is common? How do we merge issues, um, information that is completely isolated case? So these ones, they help us once we do once we do all the data collection and we all get all the um, the analysis done, we are able to 
to develop, they, they were able to use the content to inform uh, the curriculum for uh, trauma healing for girls, for women, for young boys also, because we are also now starting to engage with the teens, and just for community, in community groups. And uh, then we are able also to, I, to group and, and cluster information that we share, that we share with the, with the, with the service providers information that we share with the government officials who need to, to understand that there is need for school, school uh, support, for example. There is need for um, emotional support. There is need for, um, for families to take care so that when we have the, 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 the interventions that uh, we have in the communities, then we are able to share those information also with uh, the communities. So these are the footprints, the river of life. We first came across these um, concepts from Feminenza, but we, 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 they did not come as um, tools or as methods that we can use really to generate data. We, we, we just decided now that we have had these exercises, how can we use them to generate the data that we need most that need to help us to prepare for trauma healing? And so um, that's why I'm, I'm putting here that this is all about trying creative methods that ensure that people are involved actually in generating their, the data to inform uh, solutions that affect them. And that I'm also saying, acknowledging that, that these methods are really local methods that we use, but not yet recognized or documented by researchers as anything that helps. But we are testing them and finding how that they are very effective when it comes to um, getting data that you cannot get uh, by just interviewing or through just FGDs um, and any other. And that is how we work. Thank you. Mm -hmm.